Welcome to VMware Cloud Provider Pod Designer. My name is Yves Sanford. I'm the CEO and Cloud Evangelist of the Com Division Group. I'm also VCDX, VExpert, Dell EMC Elect, Nutanix NTC. I have a strong service provider background, and in this session, I'm going to talk about the Cloud Provider Pod Designer. What we are going to demo in this short video is how to log into the designer, the different design options, VVD versus advanced, creating a design, updating a design, and we are going to do some short document review. To open the VMware Cloud Provider Pod Designer, we go to cloudsolutions.vmware.com slash pod designer. On the first page, you will get an overview of the VMware Cloud Provider Pod Designer, the short description about the one-click deployment and some other informations. But for us in this specific session, we want to switch to the pod designer. You can either do that by clicking the pod designer down here, or you switch to the designer tab at the top of the bar. You can only log into the cloud provider pod designer if you have access to VMware Partner Central with an active cloud provider account. We are going to log in and see how we can use the Cloud Provider Pod Designer. We get immediately forwarded back to the designer, and now we can start uh, with the actual design work. Over here, we have basically two options. We can either work with the VVD-based design, or we can use the advanced configuration. The VVD-based design is a bit more restricted in certain areas, but therefore, you get a deployment which fulfills the validated design criteria. On the advanced configuration, you can still deploy a certified reference design-based or VMware cloud-certified um, design with the Cloud Provider Pod Designer. However, it's no longer going to follow all the VVD guidelines. However, most of them still apply. Let's start with the VVD design for the moment. So all of these designs have a few things in common. We need to enter um, some basic information. So in this case, we are going to pick um, a company. We then give it an email address, which we want to get the information being transferred to. Then there is an initial password. So with the initial password is something which the cloud provider pod later on on the deployment phase is going to use to initialize all services. So this is the default password for all systems after the deployment. The default per the beginning is VMware one exclamation mark, but you can change that to whatever you like. As per definitions for version one, cloud provider pod expects that it's actually running in its own domain or subdomain. So let's envision that we are going to use c3.demovcd.com. You can also specify a site. This will be used to specify sites within SSO and other environments, especially if you are going to deploy multiple cloud provider pods. This helps you to actually keep the designs separate from each other. Let's scroll further down. You have the option to choose whether you want to have the hybrid cloud extensibility option deployed. This is basically deployment of vCloud Extender. You can choose whether you have an existing usage meter or whether you want to have a new usage meter deployed, whether you want to use vRealize Operations Manager for service providers, and whether you want to have vRealize Network Insight installed. For our demo, we are going to deploy all of them. So let's keep all of that as the defaults and click Next. Next, you can choose whether you want to have one resource clusters or two resource clusters. And then for each one of them, you can pick how many hosts they shall get. This is important because that helps us to design the uh, Pixie Boot infrastructure, which is later on going to be used. And it also helps us so that we understand what the infrastructure will look like. For this demo, I'm going to stick with one resource cluster and just four hosts because there is not much more we need for now. If your company requires to use a certain prefix on any kind of FQDN, you can define one here. If not, leave it as is. You can also pick a DNS server. In this case, we have the Google DNS server pre-configured. I'm going to enter some for our deployment, uh, which are specific for that uh, Specific scenario. Let's also add an NTP server here. In our scenario, that's going to be 10.40.2.1. You can also specify 
whether your router and gateway IPs are always going to be the lowest or the highest IP in a specific range. So depending on whether you use a slash 24 or other networks, this is automatically going to design the infrastructure based on that. If you want to join your ESXi hosts and other components to the Active Directory domain later, you can provide that domain name here now, or you can supply that later during the deployment phase. On the next page, we have to configure certain networks. VMware Cloud Provider Pod is going to automatically build a complete design and deployment infrastructure. For that to work, we need to understand a few informations about your critical infrastructure. So from that perspective, we need to know and understand your networks. Let's start with the external DMZ network. This is actually um, coming in two places. We, we ask you for the same network for both the management cluster as well as the resource cluster. You can use different networks for this, but in many cases, they might also be the same. So in our cases, this is going to be 10.40.2. Dot zero slash 24. You also see these error messages which tell you whether the IP address or something is complete or there is a potential overlap with other networks. In our case, this is VLAN 402 on top of it. Next, you need to specify um, different networks for the management infrastructure. The internal network, this is basically which is going to host all the vCenter server components, ESX IOs, so this is your core management network for the infrastructure. In our case, this is going to be 10.17.10.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
when we are going to deploy um, the actual infrastructure with Orchestrate. Let's click Next and move on. Next, we have to provide some data about the resource cluster. So this starts with VXLAN segment ID. So you, in case, depending on what you are going to build, you don't want to have overlapping segments between your different uh, cloud provider pods. So um, we start with 10 to uh, 20,000 to start with. And you can choose your own ones if you want to. Again, you are going to be questioned for an external network. In our case, we are going to stick with the same one which we used before, and we provide it with a VLAN ID. You can also specify that only a specific IP range should be used out of this network. So this is for org edges, etc. If you specify a range here, we will apply that. If you don't specify a range here, we will, again, based on our IP address schemas, just pre-create one. Next, we need to specify the infrastructure for the um, resource pods. Again, we need a management network. This is going to host the ESXi hosts of both resource clusters. And we are also going to give it um, other network information, like the vMotion network, which is going to be 10, 17, 16, 0, slash 24. Then we need a VXLAN network for customer and um, other environments, 10, 17, 17, 0, slash 24, 17, 17. And finally, again, a VZAN network for this specific VZAN of the resource pod. You see all of these networks are separated. Um, we allow certain overlaps, but for example, the vMotion network of the management and resource cluster needs to be strictly separated. This is for security reasons. Same for VXLAN and a few other components. So um, if I were to, for example, just try to use one of the networks which we used on the page before, you can immediately see that I get a clear warning message Message saying the vMotion network of the management cluster and the vMotion network of the resource clusters overlap. So this is where the system tells me directly I can't actually create overlapping IP ranges. Same here for MAC addresses. As we defined before, we are going to have only four hosts. This would be the place where I can provide those MAC addresses. We are going to leave them with the defaults for the moment, but you can add them at a later point in time. Hypervisor details. You can actually select um, the specific VMNICs you are going to use. In our case, it's easy. We are going to use VMNIC 0 and 1. But depending on what you are going to use, you could pick any of the other VMNIC adapters uh, for your infrastructure. Let's click Next to move on. Licensing. Um, again, for us to deploy the infrastructure, we need license keys. Some of these products just don't come with an auto-enabled um, demo or trial mode. So to solve that, the solution is relatively simple and straightforward. You provide us with license keys either here or later on during the deployment process, you will be asked for the license keys. Again, we leave them on the defaults for the moment and just click Next. In this short overview, you will get um, some information about your infrastructure. So basically, we have entered all the information the system thinks we have all and everything which we need. You can always pick and choose when you, whether you want to generate all the doc documentation files. You would only deselect this if you made only a very small change and you quickly need a new configuration file to apply that to the automation. You can always come back and deploy the or get generate the document files at a later point in time. You also need to accept the EULA because with the send out of the documentation files, you will also get the orchestrator packages and everything else you need for the deployment, except for the initiator VM. And um, for that reason, we need to ask you for the license agreement. Also be aware that the system tells you who's going to send you the response and what is going to be the headline, just in case it ends up in your spam folder so that you can find and identify it. Let's scroll further down. You can review most of your configuration settings right here. You see all the individual details of your choices, including all the MAC addresses, license keys, and everything else. Um, if you are willing to make any changes, or if you want to make any changes, you can also, at any point in time, go to the different tabs on the left-hand side and um, change your configuration from there. But let's expect that I'm happy with my definitions over here. 
and let's send off those um, to the system for document generation. Once I click done, the designer is going to transfer the data to the central document generator. I'm being presented with a configuration ID. This ID is unique for this specific design and deployment. Should, for whatever reason, you do not receive any documents or there is anything where you need help from support or anybody else with that specific design, that configuration ID is important. Once you have your documents, you don't need to store that ID anymore because at that point in time, it is automatically branded in the configuration files as well as in several other places so that we can always identify where the information came from. Once the configuration ID is presented, you can basically click close and, you're, uh, and wait for your files. This can now take, depending on the overall load of the system, somewhere between 30 minutes up to an hour as the documentation and design guides and everything are custom built for your environment. So there is an automation process which solves that and that just needs to take some time. So in the meantime, while we wait on these documents, let's close this window and have a quick look into the advanced configuration. Let's move on with the advanced configuration. Let's click configure now. What you can see here is that everything is pre-filled. The reason for that is pretty straightforward. As you just generated the design based on the VVD designer, we haven't cleared the configuration yet and we can still move on. The configuration data is as long valid as your browser session is valid and you're not getting locked out by Partner Central. So in this specific case, we will keep that configuration because it's going to make it easier for us to show you the differences between the VVD-based design and the advanced configuration. You could also at any point in time press the reset button to get more details. One of the things which I didn't show you in the previous video is we have these signposts here. These signposts give you additional information for certain fields telling you what exactly we are doing and how things are working. So this is not actually on every field because most of the fields are completely self-explanatory. Also, if you have questions about some of the field data which is being requested, you can always look in the designer user's guide, uh, which is available on the VMware documentation homepage, giving you some further insight. Let's click next and get back to the sizing information of the infrastructure. As we can see here, we see that we now all of a sudden have a choice between storage types. The VVD-based design is linked to a vSAN-based approach, but in this specific case, we can also pick and choose. So instead of vSAN, we currently have the choice to also deploy with NFS and iSCSI. Fiber channel is not yet possible with cloud provider pod, but it might be an option in one of the upcoming releases. You can also pick the availability zone, whether you want to have one or two availability zones in your infrastructure. If you pick two availability zones, vSAN will basically be set up in a stretched environment. If I were to switch from vSAN to NFS, you can also see that the system is now going to ask you for the information for your NFS server, the NFS folder, and the data store name which you want to have in your infrastructure. You can also choose whether this is NFS version 3 or 4.1. If you switch this to 4.1, you see also additional information being requested like username and password. However, be aware that at this point in time of the creation of the video, the 4.1 deployment is depending on a software uh, that you are not going to use software-defined routing. That would require a lot more setup in, um, in the basis of core-based routing, and um, therefore we will not use that for this specific demonstration. You can also pick iSCSI, and then you are requested to provide all the iSCSI data. Be aware there are two fields down here. This is asking you whether you want to reformat all existing LANs with VMFS. So if, as long as you keep this selected, this means the system is going to go in here and whichever LAN it finds on the iSCSI system will be repartitioned and reformatted. So you need to be well aware that this is a very destructive task. You can also pick that you want to add existing LANs to the data store cluster. In that specific case, any LAN which has a VMFS data store will be added to the data store cluster. Any LAN which does not have VMFS on it will be reformatted. You can completely disable the reformat part, and in that specific case, we would expect that you have pre-created and pre-formatted all the LANs with VMFS already, and we are just going to add them to the data store cluster. 
However, we stick with our initial um, scenario from before and we will keep it as a VZEN scenario. Next, you can do exactly the same for the resource cluster. There is not much difference in there. So let's keep it as is for the moment and just move on to the next step. From the general network parameters, there is no difference to what we have seen before on the, um, on the VVD based designer. So we can keep those settings exactly the same. For the management cluster, once we look at it, we see that all of a sudden the BGP number is no longer um, a required field. So when you do the advanced design, um, if you remove the BGPAS number, that basically uses then NSX edges in HA mode. Whereas before with the BGP number, we would automatically deploy BGP in an ECMP mode. On the external IP addresses and MAC addresses, nothing has really changed. So we can move on to the next step. Resource cluster, similar scenario. We have exactly the same fields, uh, whether it's BVD or not. However, there is one slight difference. You see down here a button which allows you to switch between SDN-based routing and core-based routing. As long as it's green, we are going to deploy NSX for all kinds of routing purposes. If you wish to use um, a hardware-based, core-based routing solution, then you can basically disable that feature here and it will allow you to deploy in a core-based routing fashion. When we click next, we get to the hypervisor details. When you remember from the VVD design, you only had two network adapters to choose from. Up here, you have the choice between your ESXi boot medias. You can pick and choose between USB stick slash SD card, etc., or first disk. This is important, especially in VSAN environments, so that we ensure that we don't take your management device as a boot device. So pick and choose whatever is required for your infrastructure. Also, in contrast to the VVD design, you can now actually start and pick that you want to have two or four NICs. So once you enable four NICs, it basically allows you to switch management and data and storage traffic in two separate segments. So that is the difference between a two NIC and a four NIC design at the moment. Click next, licensing stays all the same. Next, and we get to the configuration summary page, and you can click done, which will automatically generate the new documentation. So we get another ID, and um, then we need to wait for the designer documents to show up. Once the files have been generated on the VMware document generator, the you will receive an email with a link to the files. This email can be most easily opened in an incognito window of a browser. That way you don't have to log out of your existing Office 365 account. Once you receive the files, you see there is a, a long list of individual files. Let's quickly look into them and get a bit of an idea on what they all do. So first of all, there is the introductions document. That gives you a bit of an overview of what the cloud provider pod deployment is going to look like. But more importantly, this describes the business requirements behind it, SLA values, which are the objectives for the project, and some of the other requirements which were set. So all of this is more or less depending on the choices you also made before. Also, you will find here another description of the individual networks and what we are going to use them for, what their names are going to be, et cetera. Uh, conceptual design more or less closes down on this initial document and gives you a base idea of what we are going to deploy. The Appendix A contains a list including all the versions of all the VMware software being deployed and Appendix B contains information about all other products being used. The document number 11, Architecture, Logical Design and Physical Design is the complete architecture document for your infrastructure. Depending on what you are actually going to deploy, whether it's a VVD or non-VVD based design, this document also changes quite a bit um, from its content. So depending on what you actually deploy for, you will see that all the individual layers and everything else are um, to be found in the document. The difference between this and some of the uh, design documents you normally see is that this is completely customized to your need. So depending on which options you are actually going to pick, um, some of that is going to be deployed in, and shown in different fashions. So also design decisions, choices, and stuff like that is customized to your individual needs and contains your own IP addresses 
and the specific ranges for those. You can also see that some of the graphs have been customized based on your environment. For example, if you are deploying um, VVD-based design, you will see multiple VROPS nodes. In a non-VVD-based design, depending on the sizing, we actually decide whether we go with a one or a multi-node deployment. So all of that, as seen, is in a completely customized environment. Let's quickly browse through this to give you a bit of an idea of what you will find in the documents. Here you also see some of the design decisions um, which are applied in the infrastructure. Some of them are actually um, generic for the infrastructure. Some of them are specific to your deployment. Also, you can see here that we have tables like with the VLAN IDs, the uh, network ranges and everything we defined before. So this is really what makes these documents so easy to use. Let's go back. There is also an overview diagram explaining the um, plant deployment infrastructure. Be aware this picture is a bit bigger, so uh, you might need to zoom in and out for certain regions. This explains the physical layer of the resource um, pots and the resource clusters. It also shows you down here all the individual networks with their network ranges, all the machines which are going to be deployed, including the pre-configured initiator, which you can download from the myvmware.com homepage, and which is necessary to do the actual deployment. Down here, you find information about the management cluster, management nodes, all the individual IP addresses. So all of that is being customized to your specific needs. Before you start the actual deployment, so after you review the design documents and you define that there is no additional need for any further customization, you are going to switch into the planning and preparations guide. This is a step-by-step -step guidance on how to deploy the VMware Cloud Provider Pod. First of all, you need the appliance, and that actually needs to then be deployed on your infrastructure. This can work of a VMware Fusion or Workstation installation, but ideally you have a physical ESXi host existing, which we can use. This also covers all the other network prerequisites, connectivity, how the switch over from one IP network to another IP network is going to work, the host requirements for your infrastructure, uh, definitions for the individual networks, the VLANs and how we are going to use them, and then it goes into the description for the resource pod and the resource um, setup so that you can be sure that all your physical network infrastructure works. It also contains a list of all the virtual machine um, bill of material. So this basically tells you how many resources we are going to completely use. So in this specific scenario, we came up with 148 um, vCPUs, um, which came to 390 gigabytes of memory and approximately 16.4 terabytes of storage capacity to be used. If we go back, we also have the release notes here. As usual, they cover um, everything which is required in your infrastructure, but also all the currently known issues based on um, scenarios we identified during the beta phase. Next is the deployment guide. So once you, all your prerequisites and everything have been completed, we are going to go into the actual deployment. For the deployment of the cloud provider pod, um, there is a step-by-step -step guide. This looks more complex than it actually is because in reality, all you have to do is deploy the initiator, take the configuration file, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and then off you go. Deployment of the initiator is a step-by-step -step description for ESXi as well as VMware Workstation or VMware Fusion. Um, then you will be guided on how to log into vRealize Orchestrator. You import the customized uh, package for yourself and how you import the data um, into your environment as well. Once that workflow is done, the infrastructure is going to change and you are going to start the actual deployment, which we will cover in additional videos as well. 
Once everything is deployed, you might want to take a closer look in the configuration sheet. The configuration sheet gives you really one Excel spreadsheet which contains all the values and everything in your infrastructure. So all the details about um, the configuration, sizing information, cluster information, so what is in your infrastructure, Again, all the network and VLAN configuration, and as you can see here, this basically links back to all the individual machines and individual machine data which we have defined before. It also contains information about um, your DNS zones. So you can see here all the individual DNS entries. You don't have to worry for those during the initial deployment because we will create a temporary DNS server as part of the initiator, but those actually need to come into your infrastructure later on. Um, we also have the definition for the vCloud Director configuration, vRealize configuration. So you can see here that based on that, there is a length of information in the configuration which you can see and which actually gives you more and more of an idea. We also provide you with operations guides. These operations guides help you to get your first steps in the new environment um, done and working. So, for example, for vCloud Director, this explains you how to log into vCloud Director, how to create your first tenant in the infrastructure, um, how to upload files into the tenant, and how to use that from that perspective. Similar operations guides are available for Realize Operations Manager and Extender. So there are two files which you can't open directly um, from the file share, and there is a reason for them. One of them is the configuration data. This does not only include all the data you entered during the initial designer phase, this also contains all the generated configuration data. So in total, this is a few thousand parameters based on all the design information you gave us, which were customized to your needs. This will be imported into the orchestrator system. Also, you will find here an individual cloud provider pod orchestrator package, which is um, containing all the workflows necessary for your specific deployment. So both of them, the orchestrator package, as well as the configuration file, need to be imported into the infrastructure. Again, you just follow um, guide 31, deployment guide, and that's going to guide you through it. And in one of the next videos, I'm going to show you how that's actually going to work for the data which we have just provided here. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download the config data file because we are going to, um, as I promised before, quickly take a look on how to actually make changes to your infrastructure. So for that specific scenario, I'm going to um, click choose your own configuration, pick the file, upload and edit, and as you can see here, as you can see, all of a sudden, all the data is back into the system, and I could now actually go in here, make changes, and have the complete document set or anything else regenerated for my personal use. Thank you for watching this video. Again, my name is Yves Sanford. I'm the CEO of the Comdivision Group. Reach out to me on Twitter if you have any further questions. My Twitter handle is at Yves Sanford, or contact us over the Comdivision Group Twitter handle at Comdivision.